Hello and welcome to another edition of Physics 264 Pre-Lab Tutorials. I'm Dr. Steve Brule. Today we're going to study the Winebridge Oscillator. We'll learn about resonance filters. We'll turn our resonance filter into an unregulated Winebridge Oscillator. Then we'll learn why the overall gain of an oscillator must be greater than one for the oscillator to oscillate. And finally, we'll add a regulator circuit to our oscillator so that it creates a nice sine wave. Well, here's the Bode diagram for our resonance filter. Um, in our last lab, we learned how to make a high pass filter whose cutoff frequency was this. And uh, remember, a cutoff frequency is where you get a minus 3 dB gain on your um, output. Minus 3 dB gain, 3 dB gain means 0 0.707 times the output. And we learned how to make a low pass filter, so that's allowing low frequencies to come through. And we use the same equation for the cutoff frequency, which is, um, there, there we go. We just now have the filter over here. Okay, then we combined our high pass filter with the low pass filter and got a band pass filter where we went up and then we went down. Well, in a resonance filter, what you do is you set your low frequency here, here's the low frequency, equal to the high frequency. So each these two points will be the same. So you're going to go up and then come back down without this band in the middle. And this is what it looks like. So here's the low pass filter looking like that. Here's the high pass filter looking like this. And since each one of those filters have a minus 3 dB gain at the resonant frequency, we'll end up um, having a drop of double that. So it'll be minus 6 dB at the resonant frequency for our resonant curve. So the resonant curve starts low frequency, comes up here, resonant frequency and then goes down again for higher frequency. Since e Oh, I just told you that. We will see that a Winebridge oscillator uses a resonance filter to pick its resonant frequency that it's going to oscillate at. Well, here is the, an unregulated Winebridge oscillator that we're going to build first before we build the regulated oscillator. So if we compare our bandpass filter, which has been turned into a uh, resonance filter by creating, you know, making those capacitors the same and the resistors the same, so that is our resonance filter that you're going to explore in this lab too. We're going to turn that into the Winebridge oscillator. Well, what's the difference between these two things? First of all, we notice that the on the input we have a uh, series RC circuit and over the feedback loop, over a negative feedback loop, we have a parallel um, RC circuit. And over here, we've got in the feedback loop the series RC circuit, and in the in, on the input we have the parallel circuit. So we have to make, see how this was series and now it's parallel. So I switched the order of them. And they're the same capacitors either way. Um, so you just have to switch the orders. Here's the series one on the feedback, and there's the parallel one. What other changes did we make? Note that the over here the input was on the pin 2, which is the negative input. Now I've moved the input over here. This junction right here is now on the positive input of the op amp, which is pin 3. And we also got rid of this guy. One other difference is... See, here we had an oscilloscope coming in, not an oscilloscope, a function generator coming in and driving our filter, and then we looked at the output of the filter from here. But now we've put a ground on the input. Isn't that odd? But we've got positive feedback, so it's going to oscillate even without an input. This is going to be a complicated circuit. It might be the most complicated circuit you'll build this semester. So we have to be really meticulous about how we build our circuits. So see how I cut the leads of this um, resistor down so it, it's not sticking way up out of the circuit to bump on things. I also trim the leads of this capacitor so they weren't um, touching anything. These I thought were okay the way they are. Another thing I want to caution you about is when you put your leads into the breadboard, 
um, I see a lot of students just using their fingers to put those leads in and your fingers are too big and they bump into things and you're never sure whether you get it in or not and if you just have one bad connection it'll cause your whole circuit not to work so I'm recommending that whenever you put any of these leads into your breadboard use your needle nose and push them in really good I was even having trouble with that without the needle nose okay so now we've got this circuit built with the parallel, we have the parallel ones on the input going to ground. We've got the series ones coming over here. But now we have to worry about these two resistors. We have to put them in. Okay, so you might think that R4 is just going from pin 2 to 6. And in the old days, we would just put R4 right across here. But that's way too messy for this circuit. And we're going we're to need all the room that we can muster. So um, don't do that. So instead, what we're going to do is run jumpers out to some space over here where we've got plenty of room to add things. So add two little jumpers and cut your wire just the right length. Don't have it coming up like this and coming back in and coming like this and coming back in. It'll create a mess. And when you have a mess, it doesn't work. Um, it might work, but chances are it wouldn't. And when you try to um, troubleshoot a mess, it's really tough to try to figure out what went wrong. So see how nice that looks? It's nicely trimmed wires. Okay. Um, and we're not going to use black, red, orange, or blue because those are for our, our negative, or our ground rail, our plus 5 rail, our plus 15, and our negative 12 rail. Okay, so now I've just added this resistor between these two points. You know, this is not connected on the breadboard. So I'm going from this row of, of connectors to this row, which and that's connected over here to pin 2 and pin 6. So I've done this sort of by remote control. I'm moving the, uh, the mess over to here. And again, look how I trim those leads of that resistor so it was nice and tight in there, not sticking up to bump on into things. That's our 2.2K. Then we needed a 1.1K, uh, not 1.1, but a 1K uh, resistor going from that point, pin 2, to ground. So there it is, and there's pin 2, and it's going from that point to ground. See how that works? We add a wire to our external connector so that we can connect our oscilloscope, and we just watch what this thing is doing. And look at it, it's oscillating. So if your circuit does not oscillate, Call your lab instructor for help or try to figure out why it is yourself. Well, let's look to part three of the lab, changing gain of the oscillator. That's going to be manipulating these two resistors. When your oscillator is oscillating, the output voltage is going up and down on the output. The sine wave right here. And that is driving this um, filter circuit that we've built. Well, we know that there's no current that is going to go into the op amp here. That, um, so this point is, whether or not the op amp is connected here, it doesn't even matter because there's such high impedance on the input impedance of the op amp that it's not going to alter what's going on in the filter circuit. It's one of our golden rules. <clears throat> so this output voltage is essentially driving our filter circuit, which is made up of two different filters. So the presence of the op amp is not changing the response of the filters. Uh, so these filters are acting in a passive mode, not actively. Well, I just uh, wired that up in multi-sim to take a look at see what that looks like and it turns out that the and you can work this out mathematically I'm not going to do it here because it takes too long but um, here's the input voltage is going like this and you can see the voltage at this junction between the two filters is one-third of the amplitude of the input this is just a function generator driving the filter circuit and this point right here the voltage is one-third of the voltage at that point. And I'm looking at both of the voltages using an oscilloscope trace on multi-sim to show that. Another thing that's interesting is that this, normally with a filter, you expect to have a lag, a phase lag, 
in the um, voltage of the filter. But look at this, the phase is perfectly in phase. And that's because this one is in parallel and this one is in series and they do the opposite thing. The uh, series one is going to cause a 90 degree phase lag. This one causes a 90 degrees phase lead and they cancel and they, there you are. It's right in phase. At the, only at the resonant frequency though. Okay, so that's critical for this oscillator. Oh, and that the overall gain of the oscillator, so this is, this is the filter that's allowing that uh, um, resonant frequency, the maximum resonant frequency is going to occur on this pin, and it's going to be one-third the output voltage. But the overall gain of an op-amp, of the amplifier in general, has to be greater than one if this thing is going to oscillate. So if it's going to oscillate we're going to have to make the gain of this part of the amplifier, which is like a non-inverting amplifier. Remember that from, forget what lab it was, earlier in the semester we learned about non-inverting amplifiers. And just by changing these resistors we change the gain. Here I just ran a simulation of a wine, vine bridge oscillator and um, Looking at it at the initial point, it just starts oscillating a little bit. And every little oscillation, it's getting a little bit bigger because the gain is more than 1. So if it's point 0.1, say 1.1, then it's ten. every one of these oscillations is going to be 10% bigger than the previous oscillations. And they just keep going like that. And, and you'd think, well, should it go forever? It, will it? But there are factors that limit the growth of this, so it eventually, uh, and we'll look at that in our regulator circuit. Okay, so we need that the, the gain for this part of the amplifier to be greater than 3 because the gain of this part is cutting it down by one, one third. So when you multiply the two together, it's when you multiply, you know, these fractions, it's the same thing as adding the decibels. You know that from logarithms. So we multiply the negative 3 by the 3 and we get 1. All right. Um, changing R4 to 1K. Oh, so in part of the lab, you're going to change this resistor and make it smaller, which is going to make your gain smaller. Do you think that your oscillator will oscillate if its gain is 2 when we need a gain of 3? Probably not. Okay. Let's look at the regular wine bridge oscillator, not the regulator, the regulated wine bridge oscillator. And that's, we get the regulation by adding this circuit right here. So with these two diodes that are facing in the opposite direction, they'll only start conducting in either direction if the voltage across R4, which is a voltage across right here, is greater than the forward bias voltage of a diode, which is about 0.7 volts. So under 0.7 volts, this circuit acts like it's not even there. But then once it gets over 0.7 volts, well then the diodes start conducting and essentially put this resistor in parallel with that resistor. And remember, our gain equation is this this resistance over this resistance. So by lowering the resistance of the feedback resistor, you're lowering the gain of the amplifier, and you can lower it below um, 3, and then it's not going to oscillate. So then when the amplitude starts getting too much, the gain starts going down, and li it limits the, the uh, amplitude of the oscillation. And we end up getting a nice-looking sine wave like this once we put that regulator circuit. In the unregulated, as you recall, in the unregulated oscillator, these go to the rails because nothing is keeping the oscillation from going to infinity except for the power supply limitations. Okay, and finally we need to measure the frequency of the oscillation. We just adjust the oscilloscope so that this, this wave fills as much of the screen as we can get it. And you won't get it exactly like mine just turned out really nice because the uh, the frequency was just right to fit over there but yours might look like this or it might look like this. You just might want to make sure that it, you get one wave fitting on and not just like some fraction of a wave and you don't want a whole bunch of waves on there otherwise you'll be measuring this distance right here and you won't have as much accuracy on your oscilloscope. So for my particular RC time constant 
um, I set my scope to 10, millisec to 10 microseconds per division and um, multiply that. I measured 9.8 divisions across, so I, I say that the period of this waveform is 98 microseconds. The frequency is just 1 over the period, so that's about 10,000 hertz. And then I use my theoretical equation to calculate the theoretical um, frequency that this should oscillate at, and they're pretty darn close. Well, we hope you've enjoyed the show today and look forward to seeing you in lab this week.